everyone! I'm NipFX, but you can call me Nikolai, and today it's gonna to be you, me, Ron Pressler, and the state of Project Loom. Ron Pressler is the lead of Project Loom, which will bring fibers or virtual threads to Java. And during the 26 hour livestream, we spent most of an hour talking about it. We covered the project's core mission, challenges like interaction with debuggers and garbage collection, the timeline for the next steps, spoiler, Loom is in final descent, compatibility with existing code, and a few more things. Check out the timestamps in the description to jump to what interests you most. Now without further ado, let's get it on! So I want to figure out most of the conversation, like where we're at, what the actual state is, what you're currently working on, what you think will happen soon or just recently happened. But I think it's important to span the, the path from where we are still, because except for some under the hood refactoring, I think Loom did not you know, put much into the released versions yet. Um, but from there to the perfect goal of Loom is done, you know, like having those both endpoints, that would be kind of nice. Right. So um, where we are today is Java is uh, very, very sensibly used to uh, write servers. Um, and servers are a kind of a concurrent application. So what do I mean by concurrency? Uh, not to be confused with, with parallelism. It means that the application has to handle uh, a large number of largely independent tasks. So every request coming in from different users is mostly independent. Um, and they're all competing for the limited resources you have. So you might have 100 servers, you might have one or two, but um, you have some limited number. And if we look at one server, it's handling some number of concurrent requests, uh, which are mostly independent. Uh, it, and um, they're competing for resources. Now, um, it's better, of course, to if if you have you know a large application, let's say your Netflix or Google or even a smaller company, it's a bank. Uh, you want to have um, to make optimal use of the hardware you have, right? So if if your server could handle, uh, let's say you need you need. Uh, I don't know, 100,000 concurrent users. And if your server could handle 50,000, then you'd want, you, you, you want to have just two servers, or maybe you know four for redundancy, but not 40, uh, because that, that, is, that costs you a lot of money. Uh, so you want each of the server, each of your servers, to, to optimally use its resources and to handle the maximum number of concurrent connections that it can, of course, leaving some room for um, the spikes, etc. Um, and today, this is a bit hard because uh, in Java, developers are faced with a choice, and none of the options are particularly appealing or, or, or perfect. Uh, they could write code uh, using a style of coding that's been there since the beginning of Java, uh, which is uh, the thread current quest model. Which like the old servlets model or the Jack for ranks, you you start and end processing a uh, an incoming request, an incoming transaction on a single thread. You might branch out, but for the duration of the transaction, you're holding on to a thread. And the entire um, Java platform has been designed around that. Uh, right? So you have debuggers that you can step through execution on a thread. And you can um, uh, if you use a profile like JFR and, and, and Java uh, uh, and JMC. Was that Java Management Console? No, Java Mission. Mission Control, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just made it up. Oh, my See, there it is. Uh, yeah. uh, so, um, yeah, let me see. Don't take up, Cat, please. <laughs> You're muted. I think it's stepped on M. Or oh, spacebar. All oh, right, if it's stepped on the spacebar, you need to. Yeah. That's exactly that's exactly what happened. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, the entire Java platform was written about uh, was 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 uh, designed. So a platform is not just the code, right? It's it's of course the code, the, the language, the libraries, but also all the tools. And uh, uh, it's been it's been designed around that use that usage. But the problem is that in OpenJDK, which is, you know, the implementation I'm working on, the the, the biggest uh, implementation of Java. Um, and in most other you know, conditions of Java that I'm aware of, uh, a thread in Java is just a thin wrapper around an OS thread. 
And if you want each of your th uh, servers to handle up to, you know, 50,000 concurrent actions, most OSs won't let you have 50,000 uh, active threads. And it's not 50,000, right? It's actually mu much more because, say, you also want to, uh, when a request comes in, you might, in order to service it, uh, you might need to call out to 20 microservices. And you might want to do it all at the same time, not one at a time. Uh, so every incoming request is going to be multiplied by 20. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not 50,000. 50,000 becomes a million now. So you need a million frames. And no OS gives you a million frames. So uh, if you want to write in that style, uh, you need to uh, scale down and, and yeah, scale down uh, the amount of uh, connections that a single server can handle below its actual capacity. So you become limited by the, by the number of friends the OS can support. So uh, even though your hardware could support 50,000, in fact, many more than that, uh, uh, concurrent connections, um, uh, you will need to support maybe 2,000, 3,000, something like that. So it's a big reduction. And instead, what you need is to buy more servers, rent more servers. Uh, so what other people do, uh, and, and that's a bad choice, what, what other people do is they say, OK, so we're not going to program that file. We are not going to hang on to a thread uh, from the time we begin a transaction to the time we end. Rather, every time, say, we wait for I.O., uh, will spawn a new task. And that style is called asynchronous programming. Uh, libraries uh, have been trying to, even the JDK itself, but many other libraries have been trying to make that style a bit easier. Uh, they're called reactive, various reasons. Um, and, uh, and they solve the scaling problem, right? So you can have, in that case, the number of, of uh, connections each of the servers can manage is pretty much optimal. It's only limited by hardware. Uh, but uh, even though there's libraries trying making writing the code more or less OK, let's say it's uh, just about barely tolerable when you read it, uh, that's pretty much where it ends. It's very hard to debug it. You can't step through it in a debugger. It's impossible to profile it. Um, the profiler doesn't know that an operation is waiting for I.O. if that I.O. is asynchronous. And you return, you, you use a small thread pool, and you borrow threads for very short periods of time. And every time you do I.O., you return the target. Uh, you basically give the thread back to the pool. And if you try to run a profiler, even if your server is busy, you'll just see idle thread pool. And you won't know how long your I.O. operation stake, et cetera. Um, you won't, and that's not all you lose. So you lose debugging, you lose profiling, you lose um, uh, various kinds of troubleshooting and diagnostics, right? If you get an exception, because each of those tasks is just a small portion of what you want to do, you get a stack trace that's meaningless. You don't know who started it, why, which transaction, why is it happening? So uh, you don't, you don't waste, waste money on hardware, but you waste money on a severely increased development effort. So today, Java developers are forced to choose between two uh, unappealing choices, either waste money on hardware or waste money on development. And what Loom tries to do is it tries to remove that dilemma and say, write simple code uh, that doesn't just look simple on the screen um, and isn't just, in my opinion, easier to read and to write, but also fits well with all the tooling, the debuggers, the profilers, the exceptions, stack traces, everything that the Java platform is designing. So uh, when Loom is there, the goal is that it will be very easy and a pleasant experience to make optimal use of your hardware when it comes to writing uh, servers to do um, a lot of concurrent processing. Uh, so that is the general goal. So if everything works out perfectly, how will Loom achieve that then? I mean, I'm asking, well, I'm, I'm, I said the, if everything works perfectly because I want to stress that I'm now asking you about something that we're not sure whether it's going to play out exactly like that. So basically you're going to make, uh, I don't want to put you into a corner where it's like, okay, but you promised five years ago on Nikolai's Twitch stream that this is what it's going to be like. So basically well, imagine, yeah. to the viewers, imagine a safe harbor slide here that says, safe. we don't know whether that's going to happen. <laughs> um, so, um, 
it, it sounds pretty simple, actually. Uh, once I said in the beginning that the, the, the model that Java developers are used to and the one that the platform is, is all about is um, starting and ending a transaction on a single thread. So the, the thread per transaction model, possibly more than one thread if you want to do some uh, outgoing IO operations at the same time. Um, uh, and the reason we can't do it today is because threads are expensive and you can only have too many of them. So the solution is quite simple. Uh, it's that, well, the, <laughs> you say that what, you, what we want is quite simple. I usually it, say it's conceptually simple. So I'll leave yes. the entire implementation part out. <laughs> right. So uh, just to make things cheap. Um, and of course, we have no control o over the OS or the multiple OSs we, we target. Uh, so rather than um, have spreads be thin wrappers around our spreads, uh, let the Java runtime provide its own spreads, uh, which will be sufficiently cheap that uh, you won't need to think much about you know creating a new thread. Um, so the vision is every incoming transaction will create a thread. You want to do um, 200 outgoing requests in parallel. Fine, so just spawn 200 more threads. Uh, just don't think about it. It's going to be like, um, uh, you know, like creating strings. So you do need to think about it a little, just as you do about creating strings, but in a very different manner than we think about creating threads today. So when we create a thread today, we realize we're creating something that is very heavy in terms of resources, and we can only have a very small number of, you know, a few thousand. Uh, and the idea is to have the, this new kind of threads be, you know, don't even think about it, just create a new thread. Okay. So, but, but how, would, how would that then work? I mean, like, that, that means then, since operating system threads, as you said, you, we don't have control over, that means uh, the actual underlying resource that executes this is still scarce. But somehow the JVM, like, does a, does a slay of hand trick and uh, just does something that makes it cheap within the JVM, right? Right. Or, yeah. I understand that that colloquially, but uh, it's an opportunity to talk about that. You say the JVM, uh, <laughs> when you mean the Java platform or the Java runtime. Um, so uh, the JDK has multiple development tools, etc. Uh, the JDK is about, uh, I don't know, 8 million lines of code. Uh, the JVM is about um, two, one and a half million uh, out of that. Yeah. And the language, the language, and the, the language tooling are about a hundred thousand. So when people say they use a the JVM, they don't use the JVM. They use much, much more than JVM. Okay. Um, so uh, let's say the platform, uh, and it's not, and, and it's important because I, I know people say you know they call the Java platform the JVM, but uh, to us the JVM is is just you know the part that's written in C plus um, plus, and in fact those those threads are mostly implemented in Java, so they're not implemented in the JVM. But they are, are implemented in the platform. So, um, uh, yeah, so the platform or, or the runtime, if you want to call it, will implement um, uh, those friends. And the operating system will not see them. They will be, uh, as far as the operating system uh, will be concerned, uh, your Java application only has, say, 30 threads or so, um, when really, as a Java user, you actually you've created a million threads. And every time you do a blocking I.O. operation from Java, we would automatically convert it to a non-blocking or asynchronous I.O. operation for the uh, operating system. So we're doing a sort of a true abstraction, a true virtualization process here. Uh, the OS would feel as if you were writing in an asynchronous style, doing just asynchronous I.O. using a small number of friends. But you, as a developer, would feel as if you're creating a million friends. And it's not just you, and this is very, very, very important. It's not just you as a developer writing code. It's also you as a developer debugging code and profiling code and troubleshooting code. Um, all of that is, is virtualized to give you uh, Threads from Java's perspective that are not OS threads. Okay, so um, uh, you mentioned that um, that you, for debugging and tooling, you still want to keep up basically the uh, 
um, the, the facade of this all being like, like normal threads. So just things, you know, that all, they all keep working. So I assume that would be the challenge, right? Because what you just described basically, you say like, okay, under the hood, we're doing all these SM calls with just a limited number of threads that the operating system gives us. Uh, then that part sounds a lot like what you said earlier about async programming in general, right? So like it's it's like of course they do it in a different way, obviously, but it's still like to the operating system as you mentioned it looks the same. So what I think that Loom has to do is keep keep keeping information and things in place, so all, all the things that that, that that the tooling observes, so it works. So for example, I think of threat locals or you know what other things that that threat IDs or other stuff that people. Or that oh, sorry, not people, but that, that programs or libraries can use or pull these kind of threading information, and those all have to stick to the um, um, to the idea that well, I'm giving you information, but that relates to a not real, like not to the operating system threat. It, but, it is a real threat from Java's perspective. It's not a real threat. So um, yeah, we're adding a new kind of thing and presenting it as an old kind of thing, and. Yeah, while Loom has had uh, many different challenges, uh, one of the biggest ones was the debugger support. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is something interesting there. Um, I think we're almost there. If you use the early access build today, we up we update them quite regularly, uh, and you try to use you know um, your debugger in you know, Eclipse or NetBeans or uh, IntelliJ, uh, it would just work. So, so let me interrupt you. When you say early access build, you mean the Project Loom early access build, of course, not the ones for Java 17 or something. The Project Loom early access yeah. build, it would just work. But uh, there are some interesting challenges. Uh, it's not enough to say that uh, it's OK to say that, uh, all right, we have this new kind of thread. It looks like the old one, but it's not really. Uh, the and, and hide that from the debugger, uh, the problem is that there are some things that the debugger has to present to the user and are now going to be different. And that is mostly has to do with the number of threads. So if you if you are used to uh, using a debugger, uh, you s normally see that most of them give you show you a list of all of your threads. Um, with Loom, it's possible to have you know 100,000 or a million threads. Uh, most of the IDs would just you know freeze or crash. If just in terms of, of, of UI, if they try to present you with a list of million items. But even if they didn't, uh, let's say, you know, they never thought of that, then they can fix it. Uh, it's not going to be very useful, right? Yeah. What, what is a list of million things going to do? It's not like you're going to check and click on them. It's not going to give you any extra information. So uh, one of the interesting challenges is how to present that information, just which friends you have, in a way that makes sense to the user. I don't think that this will be completely solved in the first release, although we have some directions there. Uh, but um, it's possible that we say, you know what, uh, we'll figure that part out. But because it's not, it doesn't make sense for uh, for you to see a list of million friends. And we've spoken to all the, uh, we've spoken to uh, people from uh, JetBrains who work in IntelliJ, people who work in Eclipse and NetBeans, and even. People from Microsoft work on VS Code, and they understand this now. And uh, it's possible that they choose not to present your list of all threads, but just the threads that something interesting has happened on. Uh, say, just the threads that hit some breakpoints, uh, because it wouldn't make sense to show you all of them. Uh, but there might be a time when you say, OK, I, I do want to see all of them, but I don't want a dumb list of a million friends. I want to see maybe the relationship between them, and that is maybe in, in, in later phases of the project, um, perhaps after the first release. Yeah, I was wondering about that. It would be kind of nice if you could see uh, this is the thread that came in from the request, and then it spawned like these two threads to ask to databases and these dozen threads to talk to other services, and basically see something that like a flowchart, uh, how this thread spawned other threads. That would be kind of neat. So you will be able to see that in the first release. Um, so uh, we don't control the IDEs, so they might choose to make use of that. Maybe not. Uh, it's not entirely up to us. But if you get a stack trace, a, a thread dump, mm -hmm. a thread dump is something we give you, and it also has this problem, right? Normally, you want to see all the threads running in your process. Uh, and if we just gave you a list of a million threads, it, 
you know, it's true, but useless. <laughs> um, like, uh, you know, like a joke about what mathematicians say. You know, obviously true, but useless. <laughs> so, um, uh, we do have something called, uh, based on an idea that wasn't our own, but we borrowed from elsewhere in the line called structure concurrency, uh, that sort of maintains a relationship between different frames. So if in the process of handling an incoming transaction, say you're an HTTP server, you have an incoming request, and in the process of handling that, you want to do uh, 10 outgoing calls, HTTP client calls to microservice. Uh, and you want to do each of them on a separate thread. Uh, and again, threads are nearly free, right? So you don't need to care about that. You just create 10 more threads. Um, then we would present, and in that case, the parent thread would want to wait for those results and collect them. So there is a clear, you know, sort of parent-child relationship. Mm -hmm. The parent create those, creates those child friends and waits for them. Um, and that gives us some structure. And we could reflect that structure in the tool and present you, in fact, rather than a list of friends, we give you a tree uh, containing the relationship provided that you create those friends using uh, some new APIs that we might have uh, that express your intent to say, these new threads are doing work on my behalf. Um, and then and then we can present that in the tool. Yeah. So um, so actually, that, that's, that, that's interesting because I didn't consider that before. So I thought, well, the, the end point of Project Loom is, well, we, you know, we got the, we got the, we got the virtual threads, so we got the performance problem solved. So, you know, but you say, no, there's things after that, like making it better and easier and more accessible, for example, to deal um, from, a, from a, a tooling perspective or from a, another perspective to deal with all of those threats. And you said that's actually been, uh, a, you know, one of, the, one of the more interesting or one of the more challenging issues. What are other challenging issues? Like, um, for example, you said um, making sure that debuggers work and that they actually accept the virtual threat as like as a threat and you know show them in their tooling so without going into too much depth just to like to give us a broad idea of what are the different challenges that you're currently um uh, dealing with uh so i, I would so currently to be honest like i think I, I, and i don't want to make promises but i think we're sort of um hopefully yeah uh, during the final descent Right, so we're now mostly converging, doing benchmarking and testing and completing a port to ARM64. Um, our current open challenges still have to do around the debugger support, but some of the things we've had to deal with until now, uh, in the last you know, three years that we've worked on it. Um, the, the area I know most uh, is the portion of those threads that is implemented in the VM. That, that part is actually in the JVM. Uh, and um, we split the notion of what a thread is into two components. Uh, and one of them we did in Java in the libraries, and the other we did uh, in the VM. Uh, so the part that so the part that's in the VM, we call it continuations. So if you think of what, what's a thread, a thread needs the ability to say to run something uh, and then suspend itself to say, I'm waiting for something, but remember wh where I was. Uh, and then uh, when the right time comes, uh, continue. Um, that's one, and that is a continuation, something that tells you when you can stop execution and resume it, suspend and resume it. Um, the other part is job of scheduler that says um, that decides exactly when the right time is, uh, when to resume the thread on which uh, processing call it's in. So that part, the, the, the scheduler is in Java, continuations is in the VM, and uh, one of the most challenging things was the interaction with the garbage collectors. Uh, the oh. garbage collectors, the garbage collectors. Uh, are a t tremendous help, but they all, they're also a challenge. One of the reasons uh, we can do what we do, uh, in fact, better than languages like uh, C++ and Rust, uh, 
um, is because we have a garbage collector. That makes many aspects of implementing threads in user mode uh, much easier. Uh, but it also presents, uh, because when you have a garbage collector, uh, allocating memory, I don't want to get too much into that, but allocating memory is extremely cheap. Uh, and it's also transparent, uh, stuff that's not true for languages like C++, but um, still, uh, the garbage collectors need to know uh, they concurrently with the application at certain times, and, and they don't do it all the time, and they, it's very clever, but conceptually, they scan all the objects that you have in your application, and they find all the pointers and all the references to other objects, and, and they just follow them like a graph to, to know which of them are still alive. Um, and most objects, um, in fact, all the objects that you create as a user in Java have the property that where those pointers are is always the same. So if you create uh, uh, if you create an object of some class, an instance of some class, then that class knows, you know, according to the field, where its reference fields are. Or if you have if you have an array of, of ints, then you, you don't have any pointers. But if you have an array of objects, array of string, then all the cells are potentially pointers. Uh, so that's very easy. But one place that's different is thread stacks. So uh, you can have, if if you have a, a Java method uh, with local variables, so some of those local variables are primitives like integers, some of them are references like strings. Um, and uh, even though for a certain method, the position of where they are is always the same, your method can call. Uh, your method can run and put some some references and primitives in some locations, and then it can return, and another method would be called that would have them in completely different locations, but would would be placed in the same portion of the stack. So, the location of where the pointers are in the stack is dynamic, and that is why uh, thread stacks are scanned differently from other objects and they're scanned more expensively. And we didn't want, and now we said, okay, so now we have a million stacks rather than you know a few hundred or a few thousand, uh, and we don't want to incur that high cost of scanning them. Uh, and we want to treat them more or less like ordinary objects on the heap. Uh, but they're still stacks. They have this property that the location is dynamic. Uh, that was a very hard challenge. It took us... I think maybe a year and a half, if not two years, to solve it. Um, wow. We went through multiple iterations. Uh, we went down one path. So we started with like a very crude code site that we knew wasn't going to perform well, and then we said, okay, let's try to you know get good performance. And we went down one direction for a year or so, uh, and then we had another idea, completely different, and we wrote pretty much rewrote pretty much everything. Uh, and that took us almost another year. Uh, and then we got to where we wanted to be in terms of performance. OK. Um, I want to ask a few questions that um, people had um, in chat. Um, one of them was, um, will old libraries work just fine, or will, will it be required something like async in the JS world? Something like what? Async. Async keyword. Ah, no. OK. So if it's all right, uh, I, I have like a, the subject that uh, this is a, a question leads to it. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, um, one thing I, I sometimes see when when we add new features there in general is some confusion about um, backward compatibility versus something else, which I'll uh, get to in a, in a second. So, backward compatibility is the ability to run existing code on a new version of the runtime. Uh, so that it behaves the same way. That is backward compatibility, and only that. Backward compatibility is one of the most uh, important values in Java. Uh, it's not absolute. You know, sometimes some other values trump it, but it's very, very high uh, on the list. But uh, when we design 
uh, new features. There is another kind uh, of compatibility sort of that we think of, we're thinking of, and that is forward compatibility. And forward compatibility is so. If backward compatibility is the ability of old code to run the same on a new runtime, uh, forward compatibility is the ability of um, old code to be able to use uh, new features or new features to work correctly or uh, to allow existing code to enjoy a benefit from new features. And I think a great example of that is Lambda. Yep. So um, when Lambda's came, you know, there was a ton of code out there that was, you know, using runnables and callable interfaces. And then we said, you know what? Uh, runnables, I, I say we, you know, the, the, the Java, the OpenJDK team, but I, I wasn't a part of it then. Uh, so we collectively, uh, we said, um, you know what? Runnables are actually lambdas. They're a kind of lambda. You can create them with lambda. And then if you had code that was written, you know, in Java 1.4, uh, and it would take a lambda, you wouldn't even need to recompile it, right? You can just pass it a lambda. So that is forward compatibility. Uh, it's not nearly as important as backward compatibility, but we uh, like to have it when we can. Yeah. Um, it, it's a good thing. We, we don't always do it. And later on, you know, maybe if we want to talk a little bit about records and enums, then we have something different, but okay. So uh, in this project, uh, in Project Loom, um, we also have this tension between uh, we knew we wanted something that is sort of a new kind of threading, like user mode thread, new kind of concurrency. Uh, and the thread API uh, has accumulated you know, a lot of baggage over the years. It's gotten quite big. And I have to say that um, there are many, if you, if you go now and look at all the methods on the thread class, you'd be surprised. I'm sure there are methods that you'd never heard, you'd never seen. Surely. <laughs> I pride and, myself in not interacting with threads too much. <laughs> and, 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 but, and that is the key. So we said, okay, there's all stuff there. Maybe if we, uh, if we start something new, something different, right, that would be, uh, that's an opportunity because people want, you know, to, to get u good utilization out of the hardware. They'll use it. They want, they want to use it. So let's give them something. Clean. But then we found out two things. One is what you just said. That people don't actually use the thread API directly. Uh, ever since Java, uh, what was it five? I think uh, that the Java util concurrent package and um, mostly executors and executor services were added. Most people just use execute services, right? They submit a task, they get back a feature, and they work like that. So we realized that the fact that the, the thread class itself, you know, has a lot of baggage, doesn't really bother anyone because nobody's using it. And even new users coming to Java, we always try to think, we say there's a lot of Java code out there that's still running and written, but there's going to be more that's going to be written in the future. So we always care more about the future, but we say still, even you, uh, new students of Java, they won't be told to use the thread class directly. On the other hand, uh, some aspects of the thread class or the thread API in general are very heavily used, uh, namely thread current thread and uh, thread local in general. And I think my colleague um, uh, Alan Bateman once tried, I think he said a single call to a popular logging library results in, so one logging call uh, results in, I think, 40 or 40 something calls to thread current thread. Oh, wow. So if we, if we didn't support that, nothing would work, like very little existing code would work. So in the end, we decided that this new kind of user mode thread will just reuse a thread class. Um, you will create it differently, right? Uh, you can think of it as, as a different constructor. It's just that it's not a constructor, there's a new builder, but those are tiny details. Uh, you will get back a thread but most of the time, you won't use it directly. You'll use it through you know, the APIs that you already know with future, with executors, et cetera. Um, and uh, existing code will be able to, written for today's frames, will be able to just use it. So there is no async keyword, no await keyword. 
uh, you don't need to recompile your old code. Uh, there could be in some cases some limitations where you will not get the full scalability benefit, but um, it will work. So that means that all code that, uh, so code that does not create threads on its own, that's just gonna work, right? So if, if, I, if I have a library that just does things and now it does those things in virtual threads, it won't even notice. But you say that code that creates threads. So I guess like the most obvious examples are web servers themselves, right? They, because that's that that's you know the first place where threads get either created or at least uh, acquired for, for for a task. So if they are aware of that, then then they, 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 sure, sorry, they need to be aware of that. They need to change code uh, to uh, create and acquire threads maybe potentially differently uh, with Loom. But then my code that does not create threads on its own assuming that's the case, then that will all just benefit from that. Uh... Right. Uh, but this brings me to another point uh, I've seen some people confused about. Um, and that is maybe you know the down downside of, of, of reusing a thread class. What you want to do, so we've decided to call these, um, these new user mode lightweight threads, we, we call them virtual threads, uh, uh, sort of uh, analogously to how virtual memory is this huge amount of memory that's actually mapped to this more limited um, uh, physical resource. So uh, virtual threads are just threads. But uh, some people think, OK, so if I have an application with some number of threads, I will just replace them with virtual threads. No, that will buy you absolutely nothing. So if today you have an application that has uh, you know, 200 threads, uh, replacing them with 200 virtual threads, not change anything. What you want to do is create a new thread for each of your tasks. And doing that is actually going to be quite easy. Um, so m most of the time, what you do is you just submit a task to some executor service. And that executor service uh, uses a thread pool. You never, ever, ever um, pull virtual threads you always create a new one. So instead of using uh, the cache thread pools or uh, cache thread pool executor, whatever it's called, uh, there's a new kind of built-in executor that you can just use that creates a new task for a new thread for every task you submit um, and just submit it to that kind of executor. So if you if your code was already making use of executor services um, that today uses thread pools, just change the instance to this new kind that creates a new thread for each task and, and configure it to create a new virtual thread for each task. And I think that adoption is going to be relatively easy. So there were more questions. Um, I'm just going to read this verbatim, so I'm not uh, sure whether we already answered this. We'll find out together. How does the runtime ensure that the platform threads themselves don't get blocked or the ones observing I.O. completion, which would notify the worker or platform threads? Or is it something that's already provided by the OS, like I.O. event completion notifications for user threads? So I guess the worry is you have this actual operating system threads um, that has still have like a thin layer around them within the, the actual JVM you told me. Um, and then we have uh, the virtual threads on the Java side that, that use these. So I, I guess the worry is how do you prevent uh, the carrier threads, I think they're called, right? To actually yeah. block like for real and then you have like gazillion virtual threads, they all use like the same 20 uh, actual threads that are then all blocking. So, so um, as a, th there's like a layered answer here. As a first approximation, um, a thread block does not, doesn't block automatically. You have to do something to get it to block. Now, how, if you try to block a thread in Java, how do you do it? You have to either do some IO operation uh, called thread dot sleep. Yeah, that's uh, the one. That was that there. Wait, uh, uh, some you know, uh, and all the um, Java util concurrent uh, uh, classes uh, for synchronization. Uh, so you have to ask for the thread to block. All those operations go through the runtime, and in all of them, we say, "Are you on a platform thread? That's the old thread, or a virtual thread?" And if you're a, vi a virtual thread, we do not block the uh, the uh, the carrier, the, the underlying OS thread. 
So it's not, we don't need to prevent it, you from blocking them. It's just that you can't block them. You can only block them through the JDK's APIs. Um, and the JDK APIs won't let you block them. They, they translate the operations under the covers. Now, whilst I say now, I said it's a first approximation. It's not entirely true. Uh, there are some situations uh, where we're not able to do that, uh, mostly around file I.O., because some OSs don't um, don't support non-blocking file I.O. In the future, we, we might use I.O. Euring for that, uh, on, on Linux at least. Uh, and uh, what we do there is that we do block the underlying uh, kernel frame because we have no choice. And by the way, other languages with user mode friends do the same. But in that case, we add more threads to the scheduler's uh, worker pool to compensate. Um, and there are other cases like that. Uh, but uh, ne um, networking IO, sockets, et cetera, and all the Java util concurrent mechanisms, they were the most important to us because th those are nthread.sleep, for example. Uh, those are the most common um, examples of blocking, and all those will not block the underlying kernel thread. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the point of structured concurrency, what structures would help us merge the control flows into a single point? Uh, ah. he, said, like, he, he said, I assume something like virtual thread join would be unmanageable, although I'm not sure how, what, how that, really, what that relates to. No, so, so we, we do have, have joins. Uh, it's just that they're not. So uh, the funny thing, uh, I, I won't get you uh, take you too far into this, because this is something that we're talking about right now, uh, where refining our APIs all the time. Uh, and I hope that we're getting close to where we want to end up. But um, this kind of structure already exists in Java. That wasn't the case for Go, for, Go, for example. But uh, when we added, uh, we added um, uh, Java Util Concurrent uh, in Java 5, um, we've already added structure, even though people didn't realize it. Um, so the ex take a look at the executor service. Uh, uh, it has a method called invoke all that you give it a list of tasks and it waits for all of them and gives you back some uh, correlated result. There's invoke any that waits just for the first one and then it cancels all the others. And mm -hmm. executor service itself has a... Uh, Terminate and await for terminate completion, something like that. I don't remember the exact name. Uh, shut, shut down and then await for termination. So there is a there is a method that says wait for every one of this executed uh, service to finish. Uh, we've made that a bit easier in Loom. We've made executor service extend uh, auto closable, so you can create an executor service inside the triumph the resources. Uh, and when you get to the closing uh, curly brackets, um, it just wait. It, so it calls close, which is a new method, which just calls, which just ends up calling shut down and wait for termination. So uh, it just makes the structure more apparent. But a lot of it has already been there. One of the things that's concerning us, just we've been literally talking about it last week, is that even though our executor service already supports all of that, uh, that's not the way that people are used to thinking about. People are used to thinking of executor service as an interface for some long-lived yeah. thread pool Absolutely. that you submit something and you wait for it and you submit you know, unrelated tasks, not necessarily. You, you don't create a new executor service uh, if you want to do you know, three things uh, and then join them because today would be too expensive. And we want to tell people, yeah, but with Loom you should. So there's a bit of a marketing problem here. Uh, so we might be introducing, you know, moving uh, the methods to create this new kind of executor service, or maybe make it a subclass with a nice Java doc and say this is a structured. Uh, this is how we w want people to think about it. It's sort of so there are some educational challenges as well. Wow! Sounds like Project Loom is coming soon. I really can't wait. Uh, more things people can't wait for, projects Panama and Valhalla. On the same stream, I'll also talk to their respective leads, Mauricio Chimadamora and Brian Getz, and I'll upload those conversations soon. You know what you should do now, so you don't miss those videos, right? You click the... yeah, you got it. i see you then. So long!